once again, I'm going to take this sermon sitting down because I figured everyone else is sitting down, so why not me? The scripture lesson today is, again, from Ephesians. We are still digging into eternity and exploring God's word to us in this fascinating letter. Now, the passage today is so, so long, it's 16 verses from the 14th chapter, that I'm actually going to break it up. I'll read a little bit, preach a little bit, read a little bit. Uh, hopefully, hopefully there'll be some continuity here, and, and hopefully it'll spark some ideas in your mind as well. So, um, beginning with the first verse, we are reminded that Paul is a prisoner. He is in Rome. He is in the last uh, few years of his life. Um, he's facing execution at the hands of the emperor. And in this passage, uh, he begins to, to look back, I suppose, and to consider where he is and where he's been and what he wants so much from the church that has been following him. Listen up. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Let me just stop there for a second. I uh, didn't mean to, but the word calling here is very significant. We have all been called. We have been called to follow Jesus. And we have been called to a life that is worthy of that call. Paul wants to remind us and the church that this is big stuff. This is important. So he says, to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. I think this is extraordinary, because when you think of living the life worthy of your calling, it sounds like a challenge. You know, you've got you to gotta work hard. You've got to do your best. You've got to focus on the goal before you. You've got to lean into it. At least that's what I would think Paul might say. Because we are such a, a goal-oriented society, it probably would suit our, our own uh, desires as well. But nothing of that is in here. Instead, when Paul really wants to lay it on us about how important it is to follow this calling and to lead a life worthy of it, he then slips into these words, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. These are not words that our political leaders are feeding us these days. These are not words that we hear very often on the television, and I give thanks to God that mine is dead for now. These are words instead from a man who is dressed in chains. And I think, I think, this is my interpretation, he's looking back over his life, and he's looking at perhaps what he needs most from people. Paul, after all, was a rather incendiary fellow. He, if you read his letters and listen to his preaching in the book of Acts, he is not a man to mince his words. And often the letters that he writes are angry and forceful. 
and he is constantly asserting his authority as an apostle. And often as not, he's in some sort of fracas. And so I think he looks at the church in his day, and he realizes that such a man as he, who is often in the world of events, needs to locate himself in a church that is full of peace and unity. The other day I was, uh, I was driving in Jacksonville. I had a doctor's appointment and, and I somehow got into a neighborhood that I haven't been in a long time. It's called Hickory Lane. It's behind and hidden by all the overpasses and bypasses on the South Bay. And uh, I remembered on that street, there, there lived a fellow named William Lyons. We called him Buster, everybody called him Buster. He was a, a remarkable man. He was an engineer, uh, worked for, as we called it back then, the phone company, uh, AT&T, then Southern Bell, his entire life. Uh, until he was in upper management. He was a man who, when I came to ask him advice, and I did often, he was a man who would listen very carefully. And then he'd ask open and probing questions. And then he would think a while. I remember asking him about what is this process that you're engaged in? I, you know, I just asked you about what to do for a church service or a decision from the board of the church. And he said, you know, uh, my father was a carpenter and uh, he shared with me that old carpenter's axiom that says measure twice, cut once. He said, when I am presented with a decision I like to think about it a lot, and I like to listen a lot. Well, Buster was a man who shared those gifts with his church, with his community. Uh, you couldn't hardly not notice him when he walked into a room because his legs were in braces and he had forearm crutches because his whole life he dealt with the effects of polio until the day he died. But here, here is what I noticed about this man. Uh, the church I was pastoring at, at that time was a pretty feisty group of people and they would often argue with each other. Um, I think they enjoyed arguing, and they would sometimes point their fingers at each other. Even before a meeting began, they would get into it. And I remember when Buster Lyon walked into the room, people became quiet. They would stop in mid-sentence, pull their finger back, and greet him. And Peace would envelop the room for a while. I think Paul is begging us to become that kind of person. Now, not all of us are by nature this kind of person. I, I don't think I am. I need to listen a lot more. And I need to pause before I speak. But nonetheless, I think this is a life worthy of our calling. It is not a life of bombast and egotism. It is not a life that is trying to impress somebody with how much you know or how passionate you are about something, but rather, rather, it is the calm assurance that we have one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. We are literally moving about, swimming as it were, 
in the presence of God. So Paul moves on. He tells us to aim for this. He begs us to become this. Then he writes, but each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. We're all different, right? Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above the heavens so that he might fill all things. Once again, we understand the purpose of Christ's mission on this earth. Christ came to be God with us, but also a God who descends to the lower reaches of the earth, who dies a death on a cross, is buried and gone, and yet ascends to heaven. And listen to this. The reason for it is so that he might fill all things. Let me ask you a question today. Does God fill your world? Now, not just the world that we see, the world as it is, but your world. The world that preoccupies you, that you're listening to, that you're taken by, that you have your focus on, that you're moving in and making decisions in. Does Jesus Christ fill that world? Or do we sometimes invite him in when we're in trouble, when we, when we each reach the end of our rope, when, when we don't know what to do next, when it seems that the gig is up. Oh, Jesus, come help me. For a man who is in chains, Paul is extraordinarily aware of God's presence in everything. In 2 Timothy, he wrote to his protege, Timothy. He said, as for me, I am already being poured out as a libation, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. From now on, there is reserved for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not only me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. I guess you could define a Christian as someone who longs for the appearing of Jesus, for the unveiling. And, and what veils Jesus right now? What, what keeps him from being seen fully? Well, we'll get to that in a moment. But for that to happen, interestingly enough, God requires people to pick up roles, to, to, to take their gifts and use them for the sake of the body of Christ. And so Paul writes that the gifts that he gave to some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry and the building up of the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full statue of Christ. I, I think this is significant because when Paul gets down to how the church becomes a unity, he doesn't say that we all have to be the same. In fact, he says we need to be quite different in some ways. Yes, all humble, all gentle and patient, bearing with one another, but each of us, each of us, have abilities, gifts, as it were. I remember as a young man, I, I often wondered about what would be my gifts, what would be my purpose in life. This is before I received my calling as a pastor. And I wondered about who I might meet and who I might marry and where we would live and 
what it would all look like. And quite honestly, the focus of all those questions was about me. What am I going to be? Am I going to be happy? What will I do? What is my purpose? The perspective is backwards here from our usual sort of narcissistic viewpoint. Paul says that God has given these people to the church. So perhaps, perhaps the question is not what will I become or what is God going to call me to or what gifts might I have, but rather we might ask ourselves, how is God going to give me to the church? When I join a congregation, when I become part of the body of Christ, what gift is he passing on to that body through me? You see, I, I believe that that's how the church works and that's how it's lived and survived for thousands of years. Sometimes we read this list, pastors, teachers, evangelists, prophets. It sounds like these are all clerical people, but when we read this in context, this is before the year 200. There is no structure in the church. There are no offices of pastor there are a few apostles roaming around who are aware that there are apostles, but for the most part, the church is an association of believers, and yet they are richly gifted. My friends, today, take your eyes off the bureaucracy and the structure of the church and ask, how is God giving me to these neighbors and friends who are fellow believers? How am I being gifted to them to do the work of the ministry, to bring us all, all of us, to full maturity, to build us up. But next, a warning. Before we can be built into that full measure of Jesus Christ, he warns us that we must no longer be children tossed to and fro, blown by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness, and their deceitful scheming. I am here to tell you, don't laugh, don't laugh. <laughs> but God has brought the Jones family along a little bit further in this respect by simply striking our TV dead. It's amazing. What do we watch half the time when we're in quarantine? Well, my suspicion is about half the time we're watching the news. Cable news, network news. And these days, talk about being blown about by the wind, by the fury. We have allowed our new normal to be breaking news every 15 minutes, breaking news. Something has happened. Oh my gosh, we've got, watch this commercial break. And then you're back in. The news today has become so strident, so loud, so full of special effects. Just as an experiment about two days ago, I watched a broadcast of the evening news from 1985, and I thought, how calm and quiet all this is. How sedentary the news is. No wonder when I was a kid, I thought it was kind of boring. There was no special effects and graphics and pounding drums in the background. Good gracious. We've become hooked on this stuff. And in fact, in the news today, there's very little news. It's mostly edi editorialization. And we're all stuck to one position or another, ready to argue and fight. Paul says that this is to be a child. I think probably an eighth grader shouting at their friends on the playground is 
is pretty much the way our national rhetoric goes today. Paul says that we must step away from this because we're growing into maturity, into full maturity, the stature of Christ. And my friends, I truly understand now, I truly believe that to turn on to God, to listen to the fullness of God that surrounds us, and to be aware of God the Father who is in all and through all means to turn something else off. What's blocking your reception? What's interfering with your signal from the Holy Spirit? And finally, he writes to these Ephesians. He says, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it equipped, it is equipped, as each part is working properly and promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. joined and knit together. When I was a little boy, I spent much of my summers at my grandmother's house in Mulberry, Florida, a little town, not much of anything. But she and my grandfather had lived there a long time, and their house was old. It was, um, the whole thing was an antique. I remember when we came to visit, they used to have a sleeping porch on the back that my brothers and cousins could stay in because it was a little bit cooler at night. And so I was fascinated by her house. And I was fascinated by her furniture that was equally old and by the, the pillows that she had sitting around the house. She had crocheted them. They were beautiful, intricate coverlets that she had put together and I would ask her about them from time to time. How long did it take you to make this? Where did you get the, the idea, the design for this? And she'd tell me the story and, and usually each, each work that she had done was uh, related to a, a, some story in her life, some event. But one day she, she said, I want you to look at something. Look at these pillows. What do you notice? And I said, well, they're all white. I, she said, that's right. She said, if somebody spills something on them, I just bleach them. So that's easy enough. I said, well, that's smart. She said, so what do you notice about the threads that I've used, the, the fabric that I've used to crochet these designs? And uh, I said, it's white, it's string, I guess. She said, it's pretty ordinary, isn't it? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, what's significant about these strings is how they are knit together. The plainest of things, if they're used properly, can create significant beauty and comfort and joy. And then she said, you and I are like that. That's how we are a family. God knits us together. It's not about me, not about you, it's, it's about all of us coming together. There it is again. Paul's original point that together we can create something that is so beautiful, so attractive, that unveils and reveals Jesus Christ so perfectly that it will literally take the breath of the world away. My friends, I have been, I have been dreaming and thinking about the one day that is coming when this 
this quarantine will be over, a vaccine will be out, people will be freed from their homes, free to go back to work, free to attend ball games, free to be out and about shopping and doing business. But I think we need to understand that when, when the all clear sign is sounded, we're all gonna come back together somewhat damaged and altered by this experience. We're gonna need help. We're gonna need not just bombastic leadership or another argument or another furious round of debates over this or that. We're gonna need servant leaders who can present the joy of Jesus Christ in profound ways. I wanna tell you something, I think it's right it's right now, the time is right now for us as a church to figure out how we're gonna do that. When that day comes, we need to start planning. I, I don't want our church, Christ by the Sea, to just sort of ease into reopening on that day. I want us to burst upon the scene in ways that take people's breath away. I want us to be ready to get out on the streets, to celebrate, to make music together, to lift up such, such a celebration that people's hearts are drawn. I never forget when I was a guest preacher down in Dominica, in the Leeward Islands. On this little island, I remember preaching in a little church um, that was barely uh, cement walls and a thatched roof. But the worship inside was so profound, so beautiful, so extraordinary that people literally were lined up outside peering into the windows, wondering what is going on. You guys, it's time for us to pledge to ourselves that we are going to be this people, this community of faith that is so humble and gentle and, and glad and joyful that we will grow up into the full stature of Christ. And when that time comes, we can be a revelation to those around us. A source, a source to Jesus Christ himself. We don't do it alone. We don't do it because of how righteous we are or how cool we are. It's by simply coming together and allowing ourselves to be knit and joined together in such a way that we become God's instrument. I invite you today to consider how God is giving you to the community for that day when we will all come together. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen and amen. God bless you.